Now Richard Gage is touring the country with a controversial message about September 11th. Richard Gage is here to show us why he's calling for a more thorough investigation into the collapse of the World Trade Center building. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Richard Gage with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We have 1,600 architects and engineers calling for a new investigation of the destruction of all three World Trade Center high-rises on 9-11. Last time I saw Richard was at the Treason in America conference in Valley Forge, where he proved not only to be one of the most knowledgeable people on the aspects of controlled demolition for the three buildings that fell in New York on 9-11-2001, but he also proved to be a great guy and really fun to hang out with. Richard Gage joins us. Good to have you, Richard. Thank you, Jack. It's great to be here with you again, that's for sure. I thought it would be interesting to start with this. You know, we just reported this today. The title of our story was, Happy Thanksgiving indefinite military detentions for domestic terrorists to be legislated in the USA. Now, they say that Congress can't work together, but apparently they can on something like this. And this, to me, seems very much like something that uh, you had to deal with at one time through APAC Jane Harmon, and that was Senate Bill 1959, where she used your group, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, as an example of somebody that could spur on a domestic terrorist. Of course, we defeated Senate Bill 1959 or has not passed, though this thing has reared its ugly head, the wording of which in part is a must-pass bill to fund the military. It also appears to follow the indefinite military detention of citizens and legal permanent residents. A lot of this is kind of uh, very vaguely written language so that the president has the power or the authorities have the power to pick up and unlawfully detain citizens in the United States that could be suspected as terrorists. You having dealt with that, I'd be interested to get your perspective on these types of uh, legislation. Legislation. Yeah, it's pretty scary. 9-11 was used to, to bring forth the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and now this. It is very scary. We were used, our website, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, in a presentation by the RAND think tank, and they were giving a presentation to Jane Harmon and her uh, Homeland Security subcommittee. And it was scary because uh, there were jihadi groups presented, and then there's 9-11truth.org, there's AE. 911truth.org mixed in with them. Fascinating uh, and disturbing, of course. I I've been, since that time, kind of looking over my back a little bit, wondering, uh, gosh, am, am I one of these jihadi terrorists they're going to take and, and put into jail without a trial by jury, without being able to contact a lawyer indefinitely? Yeah, it's scary, Jack. Spawn from H.R. 1955, which did pass in the House during the Bush administration, Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act of 2007. I guess this kind of shows that there really isn't much difference between the Obusha administration either way, from Bush to Obama. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a change in policy whatsoever. In fact, it may even be seen to be a, a, as heating up. So uh, it, it's of great concern. You also have Cass Sunstein, one of the cabinet members uh, for Obama, uh, calling for active cognitive infiltration of movements and specifically naming the 9-11 truth movement, which he calls uh, conspiracy theories. 
we'll get into that. Uh, what, what is science and what is conspiracy a little later on in our discussion. But that's really disturbing, having a member of the U.S. government calling for illegal intervention in free speech and movement uh, and, and organizations mm -hmm. like AE 911 Truth who are seeking to bring the science of the destruction of these three high-rise towers on 9-11 to the light. Well, that surveillance cuts both ways, and you may be aware, or my listeners may be aware, that Jane Harmon was wiretapped herself and found to have been covering up for Israeli espionage. And when she was caught, Alberto Gonzalez and the Bush administration used this uh, information against her in order to go after people like myself and, and you. So here is somebody that is covered up and, and provided these treasonous acts caught and blackmailed in order to clamp down on citizens and freedom of speech in America. I guess it's the ultimate of hypocrisy, isn't it? Sources say Harmon was overheard talking to an investigative target whose conversations were being legally intercepted. Congressional Quarterly and the New York Times report that Harmon discussed using her influence to reduce espionage-related charges against two officials of the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee. In return, the person with whom she was speaking would lobby then-House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi to appoint Harmon chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Pelosi says there was no such lobbying. It isn't true. No. Uh, 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 Mrs. Harmon, uh, Congresswoman Harmon has many friends who advocate for her. And uh, to juxtapose that on any other uh, activities that are going on is that just, not, uh, just not correct. In her letter to Holder, Harmon says it is entirely appropriate to converse with advocacy organizations and denies contacting anyone to influence the APAC case. CQ also reports that after the intercept, the FBI tried to open an investigation of Harmon, but Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez pulled the plug because he wanted Harmon's help defending the controversial domestic warrantless wiretapping program, which she supported. Today, the former attorney general had no comment. The Justice Department says only that it is reviewing Harmon's letter. You're listening to Blood Bites World, only on DeadlineLive.info. Our special guest in Podcast One, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, Richard Gage. Richard, next uh, I wanted to talk about Occupy because we're promoting today on this podcast the Occupy Building 7 that's going to happen on Saturday. I want to promote that. Today was just a huge day in New York City with Occupy Wall Street getting some of the same medicine that Occupy Oakland and other Occupy movements around the country have gotten. Uh, we've heard reports of LRADs being used, sound cannons, beatings being used, detainments. Obviously, they're trying to clear the way for more corruption to continue throughout our financial Financial system, and I happen to may not maybe I don't agree with everything the Occupy people say as a whole as a collective, but I certainly love what they've been doing out there, and I think they have every right to go out and uh, scream to the high heavens and redress their grievances. So I'd like to get your opinion on what the Occupy movement has meant to you, and what today's events, this uh, thrashing, which is really a national thing now, to clear out all of these occupiers, how that makes you feel as an American. So first, let's get you to talk about your feelings on Occupy and second to uh, removing Occupy. Yeah, I wasn't aware of what was happening today. I've been focused on uh, our movie, Getting It Completed, which is a tool where we have interviewed 50 experts from around the country to educate people about the, the Twin Towers and Building 7 at the Occupy movements. Uh, I was in Oakland, Occupy Oakland, myself, giving a short uh, talk and handing out brochures, showing our banner. We think that this is a movement that is, is energized, obviously, and capable of of understanding the greater and deeper issues and, and, and complexities and, and the level of, of evil almost that these perpetrators in power have that they could uh, start, that they could um, plan an event like 9-11, murdering 3,000 people, blaming it on fundamentalist Muslims and, and having, uh, you know, most of the U.S. population at least believing it and, and manipulating it with the media. So these people are waking up to certain media uh, and government manipulations 
And uh, when they get the rest of the story, I think they'll be fully empowered. And that's why we have been urging our supporters, uh, the action groups associated with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, to go to their local Occupy events and put up the banners give a short human microphone speech, which we have uh, for you, and we report all of the activities around the country and around the world of the at the Occupy events of our supporters on our website, which is ae911truth.org. And so all the tools are, are available for people who are interested in giving the edge, the extra edge that we feel is needed at the Occupy events to tip the scale so that they can become even a whole lot more powerful because, you know, Building 7 in particular, but the the Twin Towers also, these are so obviously planned, controlled demolition and thus an inside job that, that when these people become aware of it, they will get really upset and demand accountability in an even much greater way than they are already. But thank God, you know, they're exercising their free speech about the Fed, about the economy, about the media censorship. So it's important, it's really important that we, we do take the extra steps to educate. Richard, yeah, I've I've been to both Tea Party events and Occupy events, and and at least my sense is that 9/11 Truth is much more well received at an Occupy event than a Tea Party event for some reason. Maybe there's some issues of credibility and self censorship going on at a Tea Party event that maybe isn't occurring at an Occupy event. What have you seen, and what have your people seen as far as 9/11 Truth and architects and engineers for 9/11 Truth and that work being received at Occupy events? Well, I, I would uh, have to say about 50% of the people at the events are seem to be aware of the 9-11 truth issue and supportive of it. And so the other 50% are, many of them seem open to listening, and very few seem downright uh, nasty uh, in their opposition to what we're trying to share with them. I did, in my 10-minute speech in Oakland, receive many positive ovation interruptions of the elicitation of the evidence that we had a short, very short time to give about Building 7, about the explosive nature of the towers, etc. And so uh, I I was encouraged by those numbers, those percentages, but it's going to take, I think, a lot more of us doing a whole lot more at the Occupy events to assist them in, in waking up to this issue as a whole. You know, I guess it's true we don't need everybody, but what I've found in traveling all over the country, and I know you travel all over the world to bring this information to people, the technical and scientific information the government forgot to tell us about regarding the World Trade Centers in New York City. But I have found one thing, and that is that a lot of people understand or they pretty much already know, they have a feeling that this was either an inside job, a false flag event, or certainly used to the advantage of uh, what we call the globalists and the New World Order. It's just that maybe they don't care. Have we reached a time now, a a fulcrum, where people are now finally beginning to care about the things they might have known about all along? And have you seen any spike at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth in, I guess, regarding more interest in your work uh, due to, I think, just the circumstances we're surrounded by now? Well, it's evident, given the, the emergence of the Occupy movement, that, that people do care. And we are seeing additional interest in our DVD, uh, 9-11 Blueprint for Truth, and the new DVD, 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out, which we uh, have the 50 experts, architects, structural engineers, chemical engineers, metallurgists, physicists, etc. Th- there's a lot of interest in that movie, too, and we're going to be completing that in just um, three weeks. It'll be ready. So we're very excited to add that to the mix. I would like to see a whole lot more evidence, though, Jack, of the unfoldment, blossoming of 9-11 Truth, given that we've been at it now for 10 years uh, altogether. Something something has to shift. This message is so important because it is the Achilles heel of this power structure which put 9-11 in place, which put the Fed in place, which put so many uh, suppression of our liberties in place. I'm just crying Crossing my fingers and doing everything I can from here at, at our nonprofit corporate headquarters here to uh, to make that happen. We can't do it by ourselves, Jack, but we can encourage everyone we can to make it happen. 
Well, Richard, I hesitate to even think about what this country and what the world would have been like if we hadn't have been out there these last 10 years telling a people about 9-11 truth. So sometimes it seems like we are so slowly and incrementally accomplishing some of our goals to wake up our fellow Americans to at least have them keep an open mind to different truths, so, so to speak. Uh, that is the official conspiracy theory of 9-11 being almost completely bunk, caught in cover-ups, and think the evidence is there that we weren't told the truth. So again, I mean, it's just what we've already done, I think, has brought us to a certain level where work like yours can be populist work and not so much underground work as it's been in the past. Let's talk about uh, really briefly, and because people have heard you with me before, we've done interviews in the past, but just give people, if they don't know, A, what architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth is, you've got 1,637 architects and engineers as of late, more than almost 14,000 supporters. I think there's probably more than that even out there that didn't want to sign in. But give them a sense of what you guys have been doing, just a tiny bit of the experience. Let's have a quick overview of uh, your most explosive work, excuse the pun, and the support you have and why people don't know about Building 7. Yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. Five years ago, I was uh, still rooting for uh, us in Iraq finding weapons of mass destruction. I was a a Reagan Republican. It was really quite a knock over the head to learn about this evidence that no, hardly any architects and engineers know about. And, 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 th- and this Building 7 was the third worst structural failure in modern history, and I knew nothing about it until I heard on the radio David Ray Griffin five years ago talking about it and this ev- other evidence. I confirmed that it was, you know, that what he was saying was true, and it's not difficult to confirm that. The evidence is, is well, it's self-evident. So I, there were no other architects and engineers, though, speaking about this five years ago publicly. In fact, I, in this day, they still try to put out this meme that really no architects or engineers uh, have any problems with the official story of 9-11, whether it be NIST or the, uh, the investigation. And they have no awareness of the evidence to the contrary because the media and the government, including NIST, ignored more than half of the evidence uh, available out at the site. I gave this evidence to the firm, the architecture firm I worked with at the time. Fifteen architects, thought I would, most all of them, thought I was nuts uh, to begin with. Every one of them agreed with me at the end of this 45-minute lunch pizza presentation. I had to bribe them with pizza to get them there. They, they all signed the petition petition except for one, the boss, who was Middle Eastern. So it's been like that ever since. 90% of the people we present this information to agree with us, and many of them end up signing the petition. That's how clear the evidence is, and and a a lot of people get very upset. So we now have, as you mentioned, over 1,600 architects and engineers calling for a new investigation. Compare that with a couple of dozen architects and engineers actively supporting the official story. We have many, many, many more. Those who hear about it and joining us in the call for a new investigation. So the reason it's um, so clear is because you have, for instance, World Trade Center 7, a 47-story skyscraper, which on the afternoon of 9-11 at 5 20 with a few small fires in it, all of a sudden begins a precipitous symmetrical collapse straight down almost into its own footprint. Now, we've seen this before. It mimics the exact behavior of a controlled demolition, like in the old hotels in Las Vegas. And so everybody knows, without even seeing anything else, just the, the nature of the fall of this building, that it's a controlled demolition. But there's much more. There's evidence of molten metal in this building's debris. Molten steel it, is what it's described as by the first responders, pools of molten steel, they say, flowing like lava, like from a volcano. It's extraordinary. It turns out to be molten iron. Molten iron is the byproduct of thermite. Thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. And there's evidence produced by FEMA in their Appendix C of the Building Performance Assessment Team report, BPAT, in May of 2002, they document that there's hot sulfur corrosion attack uh, on the steel. Uh, There's intergranular melting with molten iron. There's complete erosion, uh, corrosion of the steel with holes like Swiss cheese from Building 7. And all of this is very well documented. Sulfur, for instance, is, is added to thermite to become thermate, much more effective at cutting through steel. 
So we have the evidence not only from you know the behavior of the building, but from officials who document it in Appendix C. Now that that was omitted in the final report by NIST. And so th that's one example of hundreds uh, where they have manipulated the evidence, obscured it, denied it, lied about it in order to force their hypothesis uh, of destruction by fire. And those are about eight to ten fairly small, fairly scattered, non-symmetrical fires. They were mostly on the north side. By the way, on the 12th floor, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission, which lost thousands of files related to hundreds of cases that it was actively pursuing against Wall Street companies like Enron and WorldCom. So we need an investigation of those fires, which appear to be very suspicious. Yeah, hold on right there, because this is something that would interest the Occupy Wall Street crowd as you go out to Occupy Building 7 this Saturday. The fact that the malfeasance, that the corruption and crony capitalism that was documented in Building 7, which also held multiple alphabet agencies and Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani's bunker that day, were destroyed. The evidence was destroyed, much in the same way that the evidence of the missing trillions in the Pentagon that uh, Representative Cynthia McKinney asked Donald Rumsfeld and Richard Myers about were also destroyed in that particular leveling of the uh, section of the Pentagon. If I was Columbo, I would say this is another piece of evidence of uh, a cover-up, and I think it should interest the people that occupy Wall Street. Excellent point, and that should be in our speech. I, I will make sure we get that added. We had focused in our short human microphone speech. That's the method they use uh, at the Occupy events because they don't have speakers and amplifiers. Others in the audience will repeat each uh, couple of phrases in turn. And so we focused in that speech on censorship, which we have in common also, of course, with the Occupy movement. But the destruction of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission headquarters, where they had the physical files for the, the uh, evidence in the court cases for WorldCom and Enron, severely impacted those, those cases, according to officials. Well, and you mix that with the insider trading, the put options that were placed before 9-11 that benefited people that, that we know. Uh, maybe Buzzy Krongard from the CIA being one of them, and we're still trying to track down the others. I mean, this, I think, again, should really interest people that want to stamp out this this evil form of capitalism and uh, maybe, again, open their mind to something more akin to what we sponsor, that is a free market run by the people. We're going to take a quick break here. Richard, hold on. You're listening to Blood Bites World, podcast number one, special guest, Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, AE911Truth.org. Enjoy the show. Let's talk about occupying Building 7. What What is this about, and how do people get involved with it, and, and what connections might it have to OWS? First of all, I think we should just let people know that years ago, the first building that was rebuilt was Building 7. <laughs> I think that might actually go a long way into saying you know, who these culprits might have been. It's almost as if they had the plans to rebuild Building 7 before it even came down, much in the same way the BBC and others announced that it was going to collapse before it came. 
came down. And we remember Larry Silverstein, the owner of the property, saying that they had to pull the building, which, of course, they deny is a demolition term. Though, Richard, if you talk to anybody in demolition telling you the truth, they'll say pull it is exactly the term for plunging a building, so to speak. And let's not let's not make this into a Roadrunner cartoon with Bush holding the plunger, as they always try to do. This was highly technical, which you explain. So everybody is going down this Saturday to occupy Building 7, and I'd like to know exactly how that's going to run down, how that's going to work, and what people can expect to show up there. Yes. <clears throat> well, the, the original Building 7, as we've mentioned, was completely destroyed, and uh, I, I neglected to mention that it fell at freefall acceleration, by the way, as fast as a bowling ball dropped off the top of this building. It is completely destroyed in about seven seconds. That That's extraordinary. And almost as fast, the new one was built. <laughs> I mean, uh, lightning speed that that building went up and um uh, there are many who speculate that it could only have been planned in advance, the, the design of that building, due to its incredibly fast construction. So that is the new Building 7, which we are going to be occupying on uh, November 19th, uh, this Saturday and Sunday, 12 p.m. We're going to be marching from Liberty Plaza over to the new World Trade Center 7. And we'll be occupying it until 7, uh, 6 p.m. each day. There's a little park out in front of World Trade Center 7, built a little bit smaller than the original, uh, allowing space for a little park. So uh, we hope to be joined by hundreds of uh, fellow 9-11 Truth supporters and Occupy Wall Street supporters to make sure that the public is very aware that this building, the new Building 7, is a symbol of the of the corruption and, and to bring awareness uh, to the, the, the destruction of, of its uh, predecessor, World Trade Center Building 7, the 47-story monster. It was a huge, huge building. So it, it is the key, or one of the keys, to the uh, the fall of the dominoes, which Occupy Wall Street is o- aware of many uh, of those dominoes, but but this one is, is going to be key. So we hope to be joined, and there'll be a lot of encouragement at uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, if any of them are still there after hearing the news that you had to share today, Jack, uh, I, I, I hope that doesn't uh, diminish the march. To well, and I think I think some people out there might believe there's uh, <laughs> there might be something darker afoot here. In other words, you know, let's extinguish the Occupy movement in New York before this Occupy Building 7 thing happens, because there's so much information on that that could be very attractive to people, especially with scientists like yourself showing up uh, at the foot. And I, I could see, you know, a thousand thousand people being there regardless and i just hope everybody goes out we're going to get this podcast out before saturday and sunday so that you can come out and join this if you're anywhere in the vicinity of new york city occupy building 7.org is the website occupy building 7 of course your great website is a e that's for architects and engineers a e 911 truth.org and um you know i'm really glad to see that after the 10 year anniversary richard that people are still interested State in pursuing the truth for 9/11, I saw that you know after 9/11, the Oklahoma City bombing was kind of put on the back burner, and we still have a lot of questions about that as well. So using the Occupy movement to spread word about the truth of, of Building Seven, a that it actually existed and fell, as you say, at free fall speed, and b that it really kind of holds the key to what did happen on the ground on that morning of September 11, 2001. Were you at the 10th year anniversary for 9/11? New York, or where were you on the 10th year anniversary? Yeah, I sure was. Um, we had the premiere screening of our new documentary, 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. That was uh, on the 11th. We also had a conference, and, and that was packed, by the way, at the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church. It was just packed. We then uh, had the conference at um, 56 Walker Street, How the World Changed After 9-11. Several top speakers, including uh, Cynthia McKinney and uh, Webster Tarpley and, and uh, many others, uh, gave stunning presentations there on 9-11. And we uh, did uh, spend some time around Ground Zero as well. And we had a debate uh, on WBAI. Myself and Niels Harrett, lead scientist for the paper, aluminothermic, well, anyway, it's a nanothermite paper, (laughs) 
luminothermic uh, materials in the World Trade Center dust. An extraordinary paper in which um, he had, and others, Stephen Jones and others, had documented very carefully small particles of iron oxide and aluminum powder in all the World Trade Center dust that are evidence of very, very high-tech super thermite can actually be engineered to be explosive. Uh, this is extremely important evidence that documents the source of the explosive nature of the Twin Towers. Anyway, this gentleman, Niels Harrett from Copenhagen, and I debated a couple of physicists with deep ties to the defense uh, industry, arms industry, Dave Thomas, a physicist, and uh, Richard Muller from UC Berkeley. That, uh, that debate uh, was really rather extraordinary because we're hearing physicists actually lie uh, about physics, these, these other two. It's, it's really good. So if people want to hear that debate on this issue and get a sense of what is science and what is conspiracy, go to the website ae911truth.org and just do a quick search for debate New York Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S. That's one of the physicists. So you'll find that right away. Yeah, and one of the things we saw at the 10th year anniversary, Ground Zero 9-11, my good friend Willie Rodriguez, who was a hero, uh, as you know, he rescued a number of people, including a firefighter that I had on my show, got them together for the first time, named John Schroeder. You know, he has been denied and, and pretty much blacklisted and blackballed uh, for all these years, but he was actually arrested by Homeland Security so that he could not participate in the any of the events of, of the 10-year anniversary. And of course, we also saw Mayor Doomberg, Bloomberg call out that first responders wouldn't be allowed to partake in the ceremony at ground zero of 9-11 on the 10th anniversary, which to me is just, I think, the ultimate slap in the face, don't you? Oh, yeah. These are the heroes. Uh, and, and they're denying the heroes. Why? Because so many of them have so many questions and serious concerns and evidence that 9-11 was not as was painted by the media, by the government. So they just didn't want to hear that at all. Many of them, dozens and dozens and dozens of them, reported uh, sounds of explosions at the onset of destruction of the Twin Towers. And actually, even before that point and after that point, people were being blown around in these Twin Towers, not just the first responders, but there were. Uh, occupants of the buildings. And these witnesses are uh, really uh, amazing in their physical description of this explosive evidence. Bob McElvain, his son, who was riddled with glass being blown into his body. Uh, all kinds of evidence of explosives as described by the, documented by the doctors. There's 700 bone fragments found on top of the Deutsche Bank building across the street. This is a high-rise building. These, these are a size of a grain of rice. How do you get that in a gravitational collapse which would trap bodies between floors and certainly mangle them? But this incredible pulverization of body parts, 20,000 pieces of bodies all together of about 2,000 bodies. The other 1,000 bodies are completely unaccounted for, completely evaporated. This is extraordinary. 6,000 pieces of bodies are small enough to fit into test tubes. So we and have some of them, Richard, ended up, unfortunately, in potholes as they were sent out to the Fresh Kill landfill along with a lot of the other debris from the World Trade Center Ground Zero site. You know, pieces of your loved one, victims that were taken down that day on 9-11, ending up in potholes. It, it reminds me of the story we just heard about our veterans who ended up in a landfill somewhere as well, little parts of their bodies. It doesn't seem like they care, they being the establishment, they being the government, uh, our controllers. It doesn't seem like they care much about what happens to these victims. And as you say, that's a good point because it just doesn't make sense on a level of physics, on a level of science. It doesn't match up with the official story. You have more bullet points points on the, the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. Well, these, these floors that would have trapped these bodies and, and all of this uh, equipment, computers and file cabinets, they are, we would expect to see 110 of them. That's how many floors there are in the Twin Towers, each of them. But we don't find stacks of floors down at the base in, in any shape. There's 90,000 tons of concrete in these floors and not only do we not see them, just a two-story pile is all we see in the photographs and the videos of core columns, perimeter columns, aluminum cladding. We don't see these floors. This concrete, 90,000 tons, has been completely pulverized to a very fine powder and this is seen in the first moments of the destruction of these towers 
ejecting in massive plumes of upward-outward arching streamers, almost like a geometry of fireworks, anything but a gravitational collapse which works downward. After all, we have nine-ton perimeter wall units being hurled at 70 miles an hour, clocked by physicists, landing up to 600 feet. I mean, most of this debris is outside of, 98% of it is, is uh, blown outside the perimeter of each of these buildings. And we have these explosions going off 20, 40, 60 stories down below this zone of destruction during the so-called collapse. These are squibs or isolated explosive ejections occurring at 160 to 200 feet per second, up to 60 stories down below. This has no bearing in a gravitational collapse. It, it makes no sense especially when confirmed by the reports of the first responders, 118 of them documented talking about all these explosions and seeing flashes of light at the onset of destruction. And all of this is supposedly created by office fires, which are started by jet, jet plane impacts uh, did relatively minimal damage to the columns. Uh, and even so, that is completely irrespective of this explosive evidence, as is the jet fuel, which burned up most of it in the first 10 minutes. It just simply started the fires, according to the official story. After that, we have what, can, what amounts to normal office fires, which have never, ever brought down a steel frame skyscraper. No precedent for, for these three events, the destruction of three skyscrapers by fire, which occur on the same day. Why can't we just believe as people that this is the first time this has ever happened, the last time it'll ever happen, allegedly, and that it's physically impossible to happen? Why can't we just swallow the story and move on, Richard? <laughs> because something darker is afoot here with evidence of nanothermite composite of explosives in the dust the the residue of which is documented very carefully by not only the USGS but RJ Lee an environmental consulting firm in all the dust samples these entities organizations find small iron microspheres the size of uh, a human hair in diameter in all the World Trade Center dust molten iron you know there's not there's no molt there's no elemental iron in these buildings uh, there's steel, but this is not that. This is molten iron, and up to 6% of the dust, for instance, in the Deutsche Bank building, was found to be composed of these previously molten iron spheres. Uh, they have evidence in them of thermite also, manganese, aluminum, silica, etc. Just in being spherical, there, it's evidence that these achieve temperatures of 2,800 degrees minimum. And so fires, not e jet fuel, office fires, cannot create even half of that temperature. So we know that there's temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees, really. Which doesn't and add so up with the kerosene-based jet fuel or even, you know, catching on fire some of the elements and components of the building. Is there any other place, because I've caught in a lot of uh, crap for this myself, is there any other place where some of these particulates could result in the, the falling of the building, the mixing of the various uh, natural or unnatural technological elements inside the buildings? Is there any other explanation for these traces of particulates of nanothermite? Well, the nanothermite is unignited. The, the iron spheres are the result of the ignited nanothermite. So, A, we know the spheres came from the nanothermite, which is found in the dust. And so the question is, what created the nanothermite? Uh, which is composed of iron oxide, which is basically rust, and aluminum powders. Uh, well, these particles are a thousand times smaller than a human hair. They're perfectly intermixed in the perfect percentage, one quarter to three quarters, to become thermite, basically. They're intimately mixed and set in an organic bed of, of oxygen, silicon, carbon. And uh, so, no, <laughs> this is extremely difficult to engineer. It's available only in the most advanced, sophisticated defense contracting laboratories, hmm. and it can't be manufactured as a result of uh, falling debris. 
<laughs> chaotically. And that would be exactly what the debunkers try to say, is that uh, these uh, these components, these elements are made from the fall, though I don't know how they can compare the falling of a 210-story skyscrapers to anything else that's ever happened in the world, so I don't think that precedent is even there to make that statement. I think it's a desperate to grasp on their part to debunk what they don't want to face, what the, most people don't want to believe, and that is governments have been involved in false flag terror since the beginning of history. Hey, I wonder, Richard, have you read Grim Reaper by our friend Steve Alton, who also wrote The Shell Game, which was the first big 9-11 truth book of fiction out there? Have you read the new book? No, uh, he did send it to me and, and autographed it. I was just pleased, so pleased that he did. And I understand that it is it is themed on uh, the truth about 9-11 part. That is The Shell Game. Grim Reaper would be the next, the next little uh, card they pull out of their hat which is to either fake or perform a massive pandemic. And uh, this is set in New York City. At one point, they have to cordon off New York City and quarantine it, and people are trying to get across the Brooklyn Bridge. What do they do in his new book, Grim Reaper, thanks to Steve Alton? They use nanothermite paint and blow the bridge so that people can't get across it and thus spread this uh, deadly, by the way, laboratory disease made at Fort Detrick. I thought you'd be interested in that. That's a great book, and I think people should read it. Uh, one of the things he comes up with in the book, which is true, is that it's 2012 will be 666 years since the Black Plague in Europe, and for my information, the uh, the elites love those little signatures, so I'm I'm telling people to be somewhat careful and at least to improve their immune system so they don't become a victim and maybe have a, a way out in case that's the next thing that they're going to play, the next card they're going to play. We were here today with Richard Gage promoting this, uh, I just think it's a wonderful idea, Richard, and that is Occupy Building 7. It will call attention to the fact that there was a Building 7, which is always good, because no, no one will look at that video. No one will, will look at your work and have any more doubts that we were lied to about what happened on 9-11. OccupyBuilding7.org. It is this Saturday and this Sunday. And Richard, I just wonder sometimes, with all the great information you've come up with, where we've pretty much nailed these people to the wall, that at some point we're going to get a confession from the owners, uh, from the government, that we pulled the building so that we could save life and the property, that we did do it, and we just did it to save lives and to save property so those big buildings didn't tilt over and wipe out the entire section of New York. And so we're sorry we had to lie to you, but you understand uh, that we were helping you. Or the other one, that OBL, uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, somehow got his hands on military-grade nanothermite, and they put it in there. Do you, do you expect that coming at at some point in the future, they, they just end up dealing with this information and try to recycle it into a whole new cover story? I think they would be better off continuing their denial and lies uh, according to the existing official story because that would uh, create a complete mockery of NIST, who, uh, whose engineers we know were all paid off. But then um, everybody else would, would, would know that, and it would call into question the, the whole thing, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that happening. Well, they've done more stranger things in the past, and so when they're really nailed to the wall here, rather than all going down as treasonous rats, maybe that would be something that they would try to pull. Any final statements, Richard Gage, before we let you go? Yeah, I'd sure like to encourage your listeners to be active. This is the one key domino that could start a whole chain of events when we get uh, enough people becoming aware of it. So we have DVDs in bulk uh, at our website. We have the brochures. These can be purchased at our cost, basically, which, which can be then handed out freely uh, at the Occupy Wall Street events in your local area. So I'm encouraging everybody to do something because you cannot sit on this information once you become aware of it. Your conscience will eat at you until you take action and do something to save our country, really, right, Jack? I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, with Without action on 9-11 and these other issues, we, we are going to lose our country. It is heading in a very bad direction. Absolutely. If you're out there, you're listening to this before this event, Occupy Building 7, get this information from our podcast today. Get it out to everybody. Facebook it. Get it out to everybody. Get there early. Bring some flyers and get people over to Building 7. Richard Gage, it's always great talking to you. You take care of yourself. You stay bold. We'll talk to you real soon. Thank you, Jack. You bet. Be well. Tell people about this podcast. We'll see you again. Until then, as always, I'm Jack Blood, your internet gun, saying be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid.
Gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. You still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? Does anybody else see a problem here? If the government has nothing to hide, why are they so afraid to answer a few questions? This story does not add up.